I want you really comfortable already using your thermal imaging camera. Um, and the best way for you to get comfortable using your thermal imaging camera is to use it now on areas that a thermal imaging camera comes in really handy. So what are some of the way, areas that a thermal imaging camera could come in really handy for you guys? Breaker panel. Circuit breaker panel, that would be a good one. Now what are you gonna see if you look at a normal breaker panel in someone's house today? You pull the panel off, you look at it, what are you gonna see? You're gonna see uh, the arc fault breakers. You're gonna see the arc fault breaker warmer, right? So every arc fault breaker is gonna be warmer, um, unless there's some that I don't know about that aren't, but every one I've looked at, they're warmer and then you're gonna see all the other breakers. So, you're looking for one of the arc faults that's hotter than the others, you're looking for something that, that, that's hot. Now, just because you don't see anything hot, does that mean that there's not a problem? No. No, because they're only gonna get hot if they're being used, right? And are you gonna go through the house and turn on every single thing in the entire house, plug a hair dryer in every outlet and test it? The answer is no, you're not. But you are gonna ask the client, if you notice anything, lights dimming, anything abnormal, circuit breakers tripping, um, anything with your electrical systems that you notice. And if the answer is no, okay, great. You're still gonna walk around with the thermal imaging camera. You're gonna look at the higher use areas. So you're gonna look at circuit breakers, you're gonna look at disconnects, the things like the AC disconnect, you're gonna pull it open, you're gonna look at the wires, you're gonna look at all the connections in the breaker panel. Are you gonna go through and torque check every single uh, breaker connection. No, no. no, because what would you have to do in order to do that safely? No. You'd have to shut off the main on their house, and people are not going to love that uh, as part of their maintenance. But you are going to do a solid visual inspection. What are you looking for? Or like stranded wire where only one strand is connected. <laughs> you're looking for anything that looks abnormal, right? You have poor connections. You're going to look for any signs of discoloration. That's your number one indication. It's not just something fried and melted, it's that wire looks a little crispy, that terminal looks a little different color, it's starting to get a little purple. You know, you ever see uh, those connections, you know, they start to get a little off color? That's a, you know, it's kind of like my jokes, they just get a little off color. Um, you you want to look for that, all right? So a good solid visual inspection, you have the uh, plug-in tools so that you can go through some of the damp areas, higher risk areas, check those circuits, and again, is it possible that there's only one circuit that has a problem in the whole house? It's possible, but in a lot of cases, when things are wired really wrong, especially in older houses, if things are insufficient, that load test, you do it a couple times, you're gonna catch like, hmm, this one's a little worse than usual. Uh, and that's where even starting on the other side of the house, further away, anything, you know, you get a lanai on the back corner of the house, go there and check that one. Um, that's gonna tend to have more voltage drop. And again, it has that under load test, so it'll actually show you what the voltage drop is gonna be under load. And again, it's one of these things that until we start doing it, we're not gonna really know what we see regularly. We gotta start doing it at scale and we're gonna pick up. All right, what else can you do with your thermal imaging camera right now that'll be helpful? Vents. There you go, you look at vents. And what are you gonna see if you have a problem? Leakage. You're gonna see, what, what, what you should see is you should see the center of the vent is going to be cooler. And obviously it's gonna be warmer around the edge but it should be, the temperature around the edge should be the same temperature as what? Supply time. No. The rest of the ceiling. The rest of the ceiling. The edge should be the same temperature as the rest of the ceiling. If you see real cold in the center, warm around the edge, and the rest of the ceiling, of course the worse it is, the worse it is, that indicates that you have attic air leaking in around. Right now again, that's assuming it's running in cooling mode. Uh, but even if it's not, are you going to see a little bit? Sure, but as you start to do this more and more, you're going to be able to spot ones that are worse than others. Now, on a really hot day, it's going to show up more, right? Because the attic's hotter, so that differential's greater, and so you have to pay attention to this. Thermography, which is the technical name for what you're about to do, um, is a is much of an art as it is a science, right? Like, because can you make it into a science by measuring absolutely everything and every variable? Sure, but the reality is it's about comparisons. Like, I looked at this one, I looked at that one, I looked at that one, this one's really bad. But I can see that this one's worse than the others. And because I've done this 10 other times this week, I know that this is abnormal, the, the, what we have. But I'm also paying attention because today's a really hot day. So it's gonna show up worse when the attic's really hot. That makes sense? It's 70 degrees in the attic, 
you're not going to, that test isn't going to be very valuable. You, the more temperature differential, the better. Uh, we used it the other day at Tyler's house because he, we had some worries about some odor that he was getting um, from maybe an M word, you know, the M word we don't say. And you looked at behind one of his showers that's below grade and you could see you have this nice dry shower, you look at the wall and there's this pattern of cold coming down behind the tile. What does that tell you? Water. Water behind there, right? And for that to show up, that means it's a pretty solid amount of water probably trapped back there. So that, those are the sorts of things you can do with thermal imaging camera. Like we talked about before, reflective surfaces. The more reflective a surface is, the more what you're actually seeing on it is not that surface, it's whatever it's reflecting. So sometimes when you look at something, oh wow, that's really cold. Oh, okay, it's reflective. That's actually measuring something else that's behind me or that's, that it's reflecting into. All right, does that make sense? So I want you to all unbox these, we get them charged up, and start using them as part of your regular practice. What are some other things you can do with it that might be useful? Building envelope? Yeah, building envelope, yeah. It's, it, it, you can see things like thermal bridging really clearly. So if you've ever, one of the first things you'll notice if you start scanning rooms with this, is you'll see where the studs are in the drywall. Uh, because it's conducting heat right through those areas. Now, is that a problem? No, not necessarily, it's pretty normal, but the more extreme it is, um, the more it indicates that yes, that is impacting the load in the home, obviously, right? But in addition to that, you can look and you'll see red, blue, red, blue, red, warm, blue, right? And it's like, okay, this area here is missing insulation. Same thing's true in the ceiling. You'll start to spot areas where it's not well insulated around the edges or where there's a whole bat missing or whatever. And those are really useful. It's also useful because you're gonna pick up on how much little things do make a difference. Mm -hmm. Around all of your lights, around your attic access that isn't sealed well. All these things matter and they all accumulate more and more issues. And for us, leaks into the attic are worse than leaks anywhere else. Why? Moisture. Nasty air. Nasty air and there's a ton of moisture in the attic, right? Very, very high dew points. If you want to just see how extreme it is, take a psychrometer up into the attic right near the peak and look at what the dew point is in that area. So the only reason things don't condense in that area, if the dew point's so high, let's say, because in attics I've seen dew points of 85 degrees in a lot of cases. So why doesn't, why don't things sweat in the attic if it's got an 85 degree dew point? Because they're hotter than 85. Because they're hotter than 85 degrees, right? And so anything that drops below 85 degrees, now it's gonna start condensating. So then somebody takes and puts that really nice reflective uh, radiant barrier up in the attic in order to try to make the attic cooler. Now what starts to happen? Lower each dew point. Everything in that attic gets cooler, and everything in that attic will often start to sweat. At least all the ductwork, anything that's even slightly cool. And so that's why you go up, man, all of a sudden we have this issue. Well, it's because you made it, the surfaces all uh, cooler by, by you, you know, using a radiant barrier. Now is that a bad thing to use a radiant barrier? Not necessarily, but it's just a factor you have to consider in our market. So again, using thermal imaging camera is going to be interesting. That was a total aside there. Sorry for getting off. Go ahead. Uh, one last thought that was useful when I'm in the villages, where I'm looking at like the, like you could see the, like the glass or windows. Some customers are like, I got um, double pain or whatever. I'm like, and I look, I'm like, well, this portion right here is, I'm getting all the heat. And I use that as reference to the other windows where we're like, I can show you, like, you're not getting what you said you paid for. Yeah, again, be careful with windows because windows are reflective surfaces. So if you're looking straight at the window, just be careful because it really depends on what that window is reflecting to. Um, and again, that's where when you start to, that's, that's this term emissivity. Um, you can set the emissivity a little bit on that and that can help adjust on, on your device. That's a little bit advanced. So um, in the area around it, yes, but for the actual glass, it would be like trying to, you know, Trying to do thermal imaging on a mirror would be impossible. Because when you shoot the mirror, what are you actually shooting? You're shooting everything that that mirror sees, right? And so do it sometimes. Stand in front of a mirror, shoot the mirror with you right in front of it. You're going to see yourself as though you were shooting yourself directly. Can you close the curtain and it work? If you close the curtain, then you'll be yeah. reading the curtain because the curtain's not reflecting. So it's whatever physical, it's whatever surface you're looking at. Yeah. Remember what I said, you know, you know the thing that you can perfectly measure with a thermal imaging camera. This is a scientific term. You know what it's called? Something that has, I think it's uh, emissivity of one. So it's, it means it's perfectly non-reflecting surface. So again, the idea is, is that it doesn't reflect any light. 
So things that the only thing that thermal imaging camera measures perfectly is something that doesn't reflect any light. So as you get more reflective, it becomes more challenging. Make sense? Yep. It's the same thing like when you shoot, if you've ever used those infrared guns and you shoot a vent from the floor. Um, similar but, but different issue is that as it goes, it spreads out. So if I'm standing at the floor and I shoot, I'm not measuring the, the, uh, an area the size of the dot. I'm measuring a much broader average uh, than just the dot. And so you got to know the tool you're using. The same thing is also true with thermal imaging to some degree. The further you get away from something, the more you're sort of blurring the lines of what you're actually measuring. Could you spark our imagination on how we could use it to get more dollars? Do you have an idea? Sure. Go ahead, Bert. All right. Well, there's a couple things with the uh, the imaging camera. One, when you use a really cool tool in a customer's house, and they see you paying way more attention than anybody else. Then they trust you, and they're actually ready to listen to the other things that you might have to say that you find in their house. So they to what? Listen. They might. I'm not gonna do that. That's why hurt me the first time. Um, and so. The other thing would be that when you find a problem, something that is that seems like it's adding heat, um, if it's an area that you can address and fix, seal, then you should quote to do that work and do the work. That's the other side of this. It's not just going to be a fun toy. You need to be thinking about how do I turn this into something that I can is a solution that I can offer the customer around vents, maybe sitting around cam lights. Um, whatever it is. So uh, leaking ductwork is a huge one that this can pick up on. Going up in the attic, you got seams um, uh, that are way colder than normal than the other ones. Uh, we got some leaking here. So also be processing, I'm <coughs> learning the tool, but also be processing, how do I talk about this? How do I engage the customer and show the value and offer something and actually do the work? Uh, another area, and again, you guys don't run into this a ton, um, but when you have uh, units that you can see the condenser coils on them, um, obviously there's some brands that you can't see the condenser coils not exposed. Um, if you have a bunch of running systems, you can establish whether that system's operating at proper subcooling um, comparatively. So if you look at a, if you look at shoot a condenser coil, you're going to see three different layers in the condenser coil. Does anybody off the top of your head know what the three things that happen inside of a condenser coil are? <laughs> come on, just show off quickly. So I know one of you do. Alfonso, come on, you know. Condensing. So what's the first? So before you get to condensing, what's first? It comes out of the compressor and it it's highly superheated. So what does the condenser have to do to go from highly superheated to condensing? Reject heat. Reject heat. The technical term is de superheat. Right? So the first thing you're going to do is drop the temperature. So how's that going to show up on the thermal imaging camera? Really hot, right? And you're going to watch it cool as it goes down. And this is an interesting thing. Condensers all feed in the top. Did you guys know this? They all feed in the top, and the liquid gathers in the bottom. The vapor coil is the different, opposite. It goes in the bottom, and then the vapor comes out the top. Kind of makes sense, right? The heavier stuff goes to the bottom, lighter stuff goes to the top. So it goes in real hot, and you're going to see it. And you're going to see it cool down a little bit, and then it's going to hit condensing. And then you're going to see what? It's going to stay the same for a long time. It's going to stay the same for a long time. It's just like that water boiling at 212, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to stay the same. And so you're going to see the same color. And then at the bottom, you're going to see what? That gradient to cool. You're going to see it start to cool a little bit, right? As soon as that temperature, as soon as it goes from the same temperature and it starts to drop again, you know you have subcool, right? And then that subcool is going to increase. One degree, two degree, three degree, four degree, five degree. And you're going to be able to see that, right? Yes. Um, and that's what you should see. Bottom couple rows, usually, row or two of the condenser is going to be subcooling. And so that's what you should see. The more it stacks, the more that cool stacks the bottom means what? More subcooling. The more subcooling. The less it stacks, the less subcooling. If it doesn't stack at all, you got a problem. Zero subcooling. Boom, there you go. Hey, we just learned subcooling, which is where it's so funny when I, do, I did this class with Polar Bear. So many of the stuff I did with Polar Bear, everybody hated for some reason. This was the company that came and I went and did this set of classes. And that's how I talk about it. Subcooling is the fullness of the condenser with liquid. Higher subcooling, more fullness. Lower subcooling, less fullness. So superheat is the fullness of the evaporator coil. Higher superheat, then the coil is less full. Zero superheat, the coil is completely full. Make sense? So how could you use that? Let's say you've got a, 
you're working on a facility, it's a multifamily, and you're doing 30 maintenances on all these all, all these pieces of equipment. How could you use this knowledge? Use that as a non invasive test for more efficiency. You can see the coil, and so this is especially true in commercial, like with rooftop units. You can walk around and just go, <laughs> you know, and again, they gotta be running and they have to be stable, so that's not always the case. But you can get a pretty good sense of like, which one of these is not like the other? Hey, that one's got no sub cool. Let's go look at that one. Low, low right. overcharged. Okay. Right, you literally can. It's pretty cool. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're just using temperature. We use pressure and temperature relationships in order to establish super and subcooling. But if we could have a window where we could see it with thermal imaging, we could actually do it <laughs> and, and know without. Now again, it wouldn't be a number, but the number is actually not as important as what the proportional coolness is anyway. Mm -hmm. Right, an eight versus a nine versus a seven. You know, fun fact, you might think you have seven sub cool. It's likely you have 10 or five or four because your tools are not as accurate as you believe they are uh, by the time you factor in everything. So I know, I know this is shocking. So use it on panels, use it on disconnects, use it on vents, use it in closets where you've got, you know, you, you want to try to justify sealing around it. Showing a client that, snap a couple, hey, I just want to show you a couple things in my thermal imaging camera here that I, that I found. Um, and how I always do it is it's always the soft sell. It's always the, you know, these are things that, you know, this is, you know, you've been in the house how long? 12 years? This is stuff that's been here for 12 years. So you've been living with this. Um, we would suggest taking care of it though. And, and we can we, and we can do that. Would you like me to give you a price to, to take care of this, to improve what, you, what you've got going on here? Let's say I find like a breaker that's hotter than the others, or I find a circuit with like reverse polarity or something like that, what I do with that? Well, and, and again, this depends on your comfort level with it. Um, if you have zero comfort level with it, then we're going to just refer that to the electrical team, mm -hmm. right? But I want to grow your comfort with it because most of this stuff is not mm -hmm. rocket surgery. You know, you start, you pull open a couple surgery. outlets and you find the one that's wired wrong. Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, HVACRschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast, available on all your favorite podcast apps. And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications, available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community. Vortex by Tex.